Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Economic and Community Development Committee meeting. Just give us a minute. <laughs> All right, we're just going to try this. Today is Monday, July 11th, 2022, and I am Tony Trotner, Chair of this committee. I am joined today with my colleagues, Councilmember Michaud and Councilmember Larmer. So we have several items to discuss today. It seems really strange. We have not been here in a long time, so um, it's great to be back up, up here on the dais. We have taken care of call of order and roll call. Next, are there any changes to the agenda? No changes. All right. We will keep the agenda as it is and move on to the business of our meeting today. And the first item is approval of the minutes from our June 13th meeting. <laughs> Chair, I move to approve. Chair, I move to approve the minutes of June 13th, 2022. Second. All right. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We will move on to the appointment of the Public Facilities Director Board position and Kurt Hansen, our director. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Members of Council, appreciate it. It's been a while, so pleasure seeing you guys here again. So as uh, Chair mentioned, we have a, a board appointment. It isn't for the director. It's just a board position uh, for the Public Facility District. A um, little bit of history. So the Public Facility District is a is a board made up of five positions. Um, the first three positions are actually uh, appointed by council after receiving a recommendation from the Economic Development Commission. You know, in this case, that's Kent Downtown Partnership, or say the Chamber of Commerce, maybe uh, the labor union. So those are basically outside recommended positions that are kind of proffered up to the city to make a recommendation and then an appointment there. The last two positions, positions four and five, are council recommendations. So, you know, if a candidate comes forward, it would be up to council to basically place the seat. In this specific instance, this is uh, Randall Smith's uh, position. Randall was our first, or was on the PFD committee when it was uh, originated in 2009, I think, so when we, you know, built Shower Center and created the district. So Randall, as you guys know, as council uh, came up with the, the boards and commission uh, term limitations in 2021, uh, Randall, of course, had to give up a seat after his uh, term expired. So that's what the vacancy is all about. In this case, we have Dylan Stearns, who is uh, recommended by our Kent Downtown Partnership, um, and then kind of seconded and moved forward from the Chamber of Commerce as a recommendation to City Council for appointment. Uh, Mayor has ended up, has met with uh, Mr. Stearns. We know him at the staff level and I was wondering if he's here. I guess he's not here this afternoon, but a pretty tremendous candidate. He is a CFO at a uh, local business just a couple doors down from us here on campus with Davis Door. So they're about two streets away from us here downtown Kent. Um, accomplished uh, CFO and you know I think he's a CPA as well but he'll be a great addition to have on the PFD there at Shower Center. So with that I'm happy to try and answer any questions but any of you have any questions? No questions? All right and I just want to thank Randall he's been very active in our community for quite some time um, and he's done quite a bit um, on this this board as well as other boards throughout the city so um, I want to thank him for his time. All right, could I have a motion, please? Yes, Madam Chair, I move to appoint Dylan Stearns to position three of the P Public Facilities District Board for an initial four-year term starting on September 1st, 2022 and ending August 31st, 2026. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on on the agenda, the next item is information only, but something we've been kind of waiting to have an update on, and that's the Resil Rental Housing Inspection Program. And joining us today is Aaron George and Maureen McCann. Welcome. 
Good evening, council members. So, um, yeah, you'll likely recall our last RHIP update in November when we were in between program coordinators. Uh, and since that time, we have filled the position. So we hired uh, Maureen McCon in December to fill the role, and you'll see her face on the screen. She's joining us virtually today. She's home with a sick kiddo. Um, so um, just a brief intro here to Maureen and why we're so lucky to have her. So um, she was an internal candidate for the role, um, and not only does she did she work for the city, but she grew up here too. So she um, was born and raised in Kent. She graduated from Kent Meridian High School. Uh, her grandfather actually served on the city council from 1974 to 1981. Upon graduating from Wazoo with a sociology degree, Maureen came back to Kent where she worked in her first job as recreation director for a local apartment community. Uh, in 2006, Maureen joined the Kent Parks Department where she worked for 12 and a half years as youth and teen program coordinator. And after that, she served in the police department as community education coordinator. So Marina has spent the last seven months now getting up to speed and learning quickly, and she's already doing an excellent job keeping the program running smoothly. So we're thrilled to have her in this role, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Maureen. And I, I want to make sure you guys can see her presentation. So Maureen, just for a second, would you try your sharing your screen? Let's just make sure it's not too small, because if not, we can open it on the bigger screen. Sure, let me share. Will that be, is that too small for you guys? Do you want us to put on the bigger screen? Um, that should be up fine. to you. Oh, we can't, we can't yeah, it will just be on the smaller screen. Is okay. that okay? Okay. Yeah. We'll go ahead with that, Maureen. Okay. So as you guys know, this program's been going um, since, operating since 2019. It was adopted in 2018. And there was a lot of background uh, prep work and everything to get it up and started by my predecessor, Katie Whaley. Um, so I had a great foundation walking into the program, lots to learn about it, um, but it's really the perfect position for me because it's all about giving back to the community and making sure that my hometown is being well taken care of. So I'm really excited to be in this role. I feel like it's been a really good fit. Um, so we divided the city within three sectors and we over um, each sector, we do 20% of the units um, every year. So right now we are currently in the Southeast Kent sector um, and we oversee, we do inspections on duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes and apartments and townhomes. So um, it's a very dense, um, kind of area that we're working in right now, and I'll talk about a little bit more later on that. Um, we do have about five um, city approved inspectors currently working the RHIP program, um, and they're going through that checklist of 61 items to go through each unit and um, make sure that they're compliant. Um, so it's a lot of work, a lot of moving pieces, um, but it's really a beneficial program. Um, this inspection is tied to the business license for the um, properties. So that is something kind of unique um, to it. Once they become compliant with the program, I release a hold for the business license. I wanna kind of overview um, the common deficiencies that I do see with this. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions as I go through. Um, a lot of times we're seeing a lot of missing um, smoke detectors, uh, faulty ones that have either pulled down, the batteries missing, or they're just not in the spaces that they're supposed to be in. A lot of times um, owners and landlords don't realize that they're supposed to be in every single bedroom. Uh, we also see missing fire extinguishers or they haven't been maintained properly and checked every year as they should be. Uh, water heaters is another big issue that we have. Um, they're supposed to have rigid water lines, not that flexible tubing. Um, and a lot of people do replace water heaters without proper permitting. So they're done um, without the proper tools and techniques that are required for it. Um, as you can see, the, the third photo, the one on the right, 
there's a big square in that wall. That is something that kind of came up because we required the rigid tubing. So they hired a, a plumber and the plumber cut into the wall itself. Well, that wall is a one hour fire barrier wall that keeps the separation um, between the apartments. So we can't have that. So sometimes our, you know, bringing it up to compliance can create another issue. So it's being on top of it, being aware of what's going on and having inspectors really pay attention to the different things. We also have a lot of plumbing um, and leaks, whether it's their own property leaking or the apartment coming down from below, as you can see in the ceiling. Um, toilets are a big leaky issue. And a lot of times the tenants just don't um, realize that that issue is going on or they don't um, notify the landlord. So it can create some pretty um, intense mold situations and, um, just general um, cleaning issues and health issues for that. Um, another leak is with the downspouts and gutters and roof and not having those properly maintained. Um, so we get a lot of buildup along the base of the property, creating um, a deterioration of the property in general. Um, lots of stairwells get kind of overwhelmed with the rain when it doesn't have the proper drainage and everything. So that creates a lot of um, issues with leaks with the tenants as well. Electrical um, obviously is a big component. Um, the picture on the left is open electrical um, right next to a water heater. So that poses a huge issue. Um, and then, you know, whether it's the big middle picture is a garbage disposal. Um, sometimes they get worked on and things are removed. And again, that's right there, electricity and water. Um, and it could be as simple as a faceplate covering missing for it. I did forget to mention when I started these slides, these are all current um, photos from our sector that we're currently working in. So these are what we are dealing with right now. Um, another issue that we have is egress. So we work with fire um, to kind of set up the compliance properties of um, you know, the smoke detectors and everything, but we also talk about egress. Now the picture on the left is a hoarder situation. Um, management doesn't always understand or are aware of the fact that their units can be filled, you know, like a situation like this. A lot of times though, the egress is more like the picture on the right, where it is a family trying to get the most out of space and they're blocking that window to um, get out by just putting a dresser in front of it. And normally we want to use every last space and inch of our rooms and everything to the best of the ability. But with fire, we could have it, a, a, excuse me, I can't talk all of a sudden, a residence fully engulfed in flames within just simply five minutes of a fire starting. So it really has to um, be clear egress to get out and have lots of opportunities. So um, that's a very important one. Another one that we see quite frequently are um, handrails and guardrails. Um, some people have removed them for moving the furniture. Sometimes it wasn't ever installed um, properly. The one on the right, um, we should say any stairs four or more are required to have two handrails on both sides. Um, there's a few exceptions, but for the most part, that's what it is. So we don't have any handrail on the left side of the handrails. We don't have any on the right side. And it's just a guardrail really on the picture on the left. Um, that's kind of keeping anybody from falling off, but it's supposed to have a graspable handrail going down as well. So those are kind of the top deficiencies that we are seeing with our inspectors. Our inspectors are really um, thorough with it and we get photographs um, of each of the deficiencies when they're going through um, that checklist. So that's nice that we have the kind of back and forth with it. Um, we are currently have, sorry, there's all sorts of alarms going off right now um, outside my window. There's, um, Currently, 64 of 64 properties in our uh, northeast 
section of Kent that have been inspected. We do not have full compliance yet. We're about 95%. Um, as far as West Hill, we've had everybody inspected and we're at 90% of um, compliance with them. Our current sector though, is 152 properties where the other two um, sectors combined aren't even that. I think we're at 132 properties or so of those two combined. So this particular sector of the Kent, um, Southeast Kent is quite dense. And so we weren't anticipating that when the lines were drawn, it was more just geographical of you know having a strong, um, James Street over, 167 over and everything like that. So we have really had to kind of extend things with the um, sector and we we're going into two years. Some of that is COVID, um, you know, with just shutdowns in general. Some of it is staffing issues. We've had ownership changes with the economy. We've had maintenance crews, um, and you know supply chain demand issues and everything. So we're working to get um, everyone closer to compliance as we can. Um, we have about um, 45 properties not currently inspected in this sector. Um, 33 of those are non uh, non responsive at all. So we haven't heard from them yet. We've sent out letters and we've reached out a couple different times and we are going to do that again before we move on to the code violation notices because our goal is to really educate um, and enforce it that way instead of the code violation. So a lot of it is people, especially the smaller um, landlords that maybe just have like a duplex or a triplex, they weren't aware that they needed to have the rental housing inspection done or have a business license. So um, it's a lot of education happening, a lot of um, explaining why and showing the city code and working with them to kind of understand the process so we can get them in compliance. Um, so those are the numbers right now. We did just have a annual inspector training um, back last month. Um, we typically do this in January. Um, obviously with me coming into December, I was not prepared to lead a training. I didn't understand the program well enough and I didn't have updates for them. So we waited um, until I had a little bit of time under my belt, but it was a great way to have our continuing education with the inspectors on our compliance issues, what we're seeing, what we would like to see you know, more from them. I kind of gave the updates of like why I'm rejecting and every, their reports. Um, it also allows me to verify that they have an active Washington State um, inspector license. And overall, the inspectors are very satisfied with our program and felt that our checklist was very thorough and adequately um, maintained and checking all the points that they are, um, you know, looking at. One of the inspectors said so much that he enjoys the rental housing inspections that he'd give up doing home inspections if he could and just do rental housing. Um, so it was very good. They also gave us a little bit of feedback of what features that they would like to see in our future reporting um, software. And they said that Kent is the most technologically advanced um, program in comparison to the other cities because they're able to use our software that we have for our reporting right there um, on site as they're going through the inspection and fill out the checklist um, to go along. So we are very pleased with that. Um, next steps coming up, um, you know, still continuing to work with the Southeast sector um, to obtain a compliance. That is little by little, we chip away at it um, with when things are reinspected and I get to sign off on the certificate of compliance and release their business license hold. Um, I'm gonna follow up with the properties that have not been in contact yet and or haven't, uh, or excuse me, we have been in contact but they have not inspected yet and kind of you know nudge them along too. 
And then, as I mentioned, sending out another letter before um, moving on to code violations for those non-responsive properties. Next year, we are going to go back to the Northeast Hill sector and inspect a different 20% of units um, that were than what was inspected in 2019. Um, we are planning on using our reporting system, which is called the Compliance Engine um, software for at least one more year. Our goal is to utilize um, IT and kind of formulate a system of our own in the Amanda um, software. And so hopefully we can get that up and going um, sooner than later and kind of be able to have that in-house to make the tweaks that we need um, right here and now. So, and then 2024 and 2026, we're going to return to the West Hill Valley in 2024. And then, like I was mentioning, the density of the Southeast Hill, um, we're really probably going to have to split that to make it work a little bit smoother um, and kind of do one section of it in 2025 and one in 2026 um, to make it more equal in numbers in comparison to the other sectors. So that is what I have for my presentation. Are there any questions that I can answer? Maureen, great presentation. You have done a great job coming into this and um, just running with it. So great presentation. Questions from my colleagues. Councilmember Michaud. Thank you, Madam Chair. Maureen, I just want to say I'm so thankful to see you back here at the City of Kent. I hope you're doing well. I am. Um, I am. Good. Um, I do have a question. Do we inspect um, King County Housing Authority units at all? We do not. So anything that has like King County Authority or senior um, kind of specialty like that, they have their own um, particular um, set of standards that they must comply with. So we don't go into those. Now, if there's a like a section eight tenant at a duplex or another one, um, we can utilize that section eight um, inspection in replacement of ours, but we don't go into um, the bigger complexes that are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, quick question. Do we inspect for the for carbon monoxide as well as the fire detectors? So detectors? that is, there's a little um, yes, but there's some stipulations. If they have um, some fuel burning fireplaces, um, attached garages and stuff like that, it is not an absolute enforcement um, per a very lengthy discussion with the um, fire department and everything prior to me coming on. It is something that our um, inspectors feel passionately about and will educate in their um, reports and add an addendum of why it's important to have those carbon monoxide um, detectors as well. Okay, but so we currently don't unless there's specific yes, conditions correct. and that mm -hmm. is the decision was the made with the fire department. Okay. heat and everything, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yes. All right, and I just have a couple questions. The first question is, there's no cost to the owner, homeowners except for what they have to pay for to meet compliance. Or so do they have to pay to participate in this? The fee is um, attached to the business license. Um, so there is a $13 fee for each unit that is inspected tied to the business license to participate in the rental housing inspection program. That is to help supplement and cover my um, positions, wages and everything and the um, funding for the program in general. Um, the only other thing is they do pay the inspectors for their inspection. That is a completely separate um, fee that the inspectors set since they are independent contractors. Okay, and then my other question is, um, you know, if you have places that are not meeting that compliance, obviously you wouldn't renew their license, but have we been in a situation where we have actually had to close any places or or people have to move out because they're just not cooperating? Or have we been, Thankfully, has it been pretty successful? It's been pretty successful. We definitely have a few um, 
owners that are dragging a little bit and we've had to enforce with code um, code violations and there's up to a $500 fine um, for each code violation that we can send out. Um, so usually before we get to that, most of the landlords and owners are doing it. Um, when the program was built, they did set aside some monies um, in case we needed to displace people and we have not had to touch that at all. Um, most of them are being able to successfully get everything in compliance without removing any of the tenants. Great. Well, I'm glad to see this program is working, and um, I appreciate you coming and sharing all this information. We've been anxious to hear how it's going. Yes, I'm so sorry. I couldn't be there in person. I was looking forward to seeing everybody. Well, thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. All right. The next item on our agenda is um, prel preliminary analysis on the new tax tool for housing, and we've got Bill Ellis to give us an update. Hi. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Good afternoon. I'm just going to wait for the PowerPoint to come up. Um, not to be too uh, confusing about the title of this update, but it is about tax increment financing. Uh, we are looking at uh, primarily housing projects, I would say, though, for the initial round. Uh, we're not going to be able to apply this year. June was the cutoff to sort of lobby with the assessor's office, but it uh, takes a while to first identify uh, thoughtfully where we want our projects uh, to be created, what the district boundaries want to be, and uh, where would they be do the most good and, and, and leverage the most uh, in a but for argumentation sense. So I'll go through that in a moment and then just give a general update on, on outreach. There we go. So um, there we are. So just a quick overview of the new tool that was passed out of the state legislature last year on tax increment financing. Um, if you see there, there's, there's the basic TIF model, where basically you're taking all of the uh, incremental taxes off of, the, you're freezing your existing tax base, and you're taking all the incre increased valuation of the project that wouldn't have happened but for pulling ahead the future valuation of that project and bonding for it to purchase uh, an infrastructure improvement. This is an economic development tool in many states across the country. Uh, we were the 49th state to adopt it. Uh, actually, I, I have a, a short video on, on this that uh, I'm hoping, Rhonda, I can't quite <laughs> click from here, but if you click the first uh, uh, link uh, where it says WIDA online tip for jobs, and then that'll call up a website. We'll, we'll just watch a two-minute video that actually our multimedia department created some months ago. So if you just scroll down and then uh, hit play on the first video that shows up, there you go. This will explain it hopefully a little better than I can. 48 other states have implemented some form of increment financing. As we look at how to help our economy recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, now is the time for Washington State to join these other states. Dozens of areas throughout Washington State are primed for development or redevelopment. But these areas remain vacant and blighted because significant public infrastructure is needed such as utility extensions, sewer plant expansions, street extensions, sidewalk construction, environmental remediation, and more. Funding this public infrastructure is expensive. Developers cannot proceed forward without the public infrastructure. Public agencies wanting to fund the public infrastructure spend years cobbling together several different grants, delaying projects from getting underway in a timely manner. There is a better way. Increment financing. Under increment financing, development pays for the infrastructure through additional property tax revenues collected on the development. Tell me what you say. First, a city, county, or port works with a developer to identify the project and the cost of needed infrastructure. An ordinance is approved creating an increment financing area that includes all the impacted parcels. The city then takes out bonds to incrementally fund the infrastructure, immediately putting people to work building the infrastructure and the project. How do the bonds get paid, you ask? Let's first look at how property taxes are paid under current law. Each local agency calculates property taxes by first identifying the amount of funding it collected the previous year, plus a 1% increase, plus new construction. That amount is then divided by the value of each property, resulting in the property tax owed for each parcel. 
Typically, when a new development occurs, it is treated as new construction for one year and then is added to the amount of funding collected the previous year. Increment financing instead keeps the growth from the increment area separate until the bonds are paid off. Each local agency applies its usual property tax rate to that increment growth, and the resulting revenue generated is dedicated to paying off the bonds. Once the bonds are paid off, or 25 years have passed, whichever is shorter, the new construction is then added to the overall amount each local agency can collect, allowing all local agencies to get the benefit of development. Meanwhile, the state property tax levy, which is calculated in a different manner, remains unchanged. This means that the state will collect even more property tax revenues as the project is developed. And, along the way, more jobs are created, both through the construction of the project and through the resulting development. Increment financing can be a powerful tool. It must be used wisely. To ensure that is the case, before a project can use this financing, it must be determined that one, a project wouldn't otherwise occur without increment financing, and two, any impacts to existing housing, local businesses, or fire service must be mitigated. This financing allows expensive public infrastructure to be paid for by development. It creates jobs and generates revenue for state and local governments that otherwise occur. Washington State needs to provide people jobs by authorizing the wise occur. Washington State needs to provide people jobs by authorizing the use of increment financing. So we can cut it there. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think what you saw there is just kind of a, a cartoon that flashed a lot, but <laughs> besides that, I think conveyed the idea that, you know, that we have to be very careful and deliberate in where we set these up. Uh, it's a tax law tool that's been used in a lot of different states. You'll find good examples, I would say. You will find poor examples uh, in terms of outcome over 70 years of history in you know, thousands of municipalities. Um, but the guardrails in our state uh, and, and why I think one of, the, one of the main impediments that we're overcome is that this does not involve school, school district portion. That's exempted from this whole conversation. What you are freezing within a district area is the taxation uh, on the existing valuation, and then you are looking at what is being catalyzed. So I'll give some examples of this. Imagine, uh, let's say there was a gas station and it was contaminated, and there really wasn't a way to do the mitigation, and it, it wasn't really feasible financially for a developer to take on a gas station with a large plume of contamination uh, uh, without having some other funding source to pay for that remediation. The TIF district could mitigate that and then pay off that mitigation through the increased valuation of that development that wouldn't have happened otherwise. That part of the discussion is, should sound familiar. It should sound a little bit like multifamily tax exemption. Instead of multifamily tax exemption uh, uh, freezing out the valuation, the taxes on the new improvement, we are talking instead taking the improvement valuation to pay and service the bond. So we can pull ahead infrastructure instead of waiting decades to produce it in a given area where we expect, ex uh, expect more density and more development should we be able to produce uh, uh, these public investments. We can do that now. It can also be more directly used uh, in the service of affordable housing. It can help support, let's say, affordable home ownership as a part of redevelopment. That's typically something that you wouldn't see without some subsidy. So that's a this is a potential tool for that. Um, this uh, we'll credit this to Echo Northwest. We've been working with a consultant. Uh, we've hired a consultant. We are working with a consultant who is an expert in tax increment financing in many states. Uh, including in Oregon and also in this state now. Uh, they're going to be assisting us and sort of guiding us through the process and evaluating different uh, district areas. We've looked at about 10 different district potential areas, kind of hypothetically, internal to staff. We've shared that with directors. I'm going to walk through and later in the presentation a couple of districts now because I see them as having greater but for development potential. Um, 
So what could, kinds of things are eligible? Uh, street and road construction, water and sewer systems, sidewalks for non-motorized uh, uh, transportation, parking, dock facilities, park and rides, stormwater. Uh, I gave through the mitigation of brownfields or a gas station contaminated example. It can also be uh, much more direct in sort of purchasing or rehabilitating housing, uh, especially affordable housing, rehabilitating uh, child care facilities, historic preservation activities. You can imagine uh, uh, in our historic downtown district, we haven't had a lot of uh, uh, tools to do uh, preservation of existing buildings. If you were to freeze the valuation and then say, but for the following historic preservation tasks, we could we could actually realize a more valuable set of uh, historic buildings downtown, you can start to see how uh, this is a potentially very powerful and actually a very common tool around the country rather than just waiting for market conditions that may never materialize over the next several generations to address those issues. Um, in the city of Kent, uh, this is just a look at all the different uh, breakout of a property tax, how it's split up amongst all the different government district agencies. So about every $100 million in eligible, uh, uh, eligible proper projects assessed, the value growth would generate about $350,000 a year to service that bond. Um, now our law, because it, we are sort of conservative and uh, uh, cautious about this new tool in this state, I think relative to other states, and, and, and rightly so given all the track record and all the different states to look at, um, they've done a few things to put guardrails on it. It's, it's still something of a pilot in, in this sense. You're only allowed two active increment areas per jurisdiction, and they may not total more than $200 million in assessed valuation, which Sounds like a lot, but in larger cities like Seattle or Tacoma, won't go as quite as far in terms of district areas. Um, and you cannot add public improvements or change the boundary of the increment area once adopted. So I'll say that again. You cannot add additional public improvements or change the boundary of the increment area once adopted. This is a big difference, I would say, from when I worked at Oregon, where we had an urban renewal district. Uh, you could just say all of the historic downtown of a, a city that's our district, we're gonna freeze it there, and then as projects emerge, as contamination was uncovered, it was different projects that we weren't quite expecting, let's say a community college wanted to expand, you would work with it then out of the increment that was growing on all of the properties in the district. That is not the case in this state. That is not the case in this law. It's very much but for project driven. You have to really understand that this set of projects will help realize and enable a specific redevelopment and realize the increment upon which the revenue will draw. That's a very important limitation and I think it encourages a lot of deliber deliberation. It's gonna encourage a lot of cross-departmental coordination requirements uh, and uh, uh, some strategy uh, because there's, again, there's nothing that says that you have to create a TIF district for 25 years and just max it all out. You could instead do sort of a series of smaller projects where you could sort of uh, identify a small little investment that is standing in the way of a development, create a district, go through the public hearing process, adopt it, pay off the debt quickly, retire it, and then move on, versus doing one large district over a long time horizon and doing every possible project. I think it'll help to look at an example <laughs> um, here in Kent. Here is a sample district boundary area. I'm not making a recommendation today that this should be the, uh, the boundary area. I'm just giving you an example. Um, but this one is, I think, potentially a, a redevelopable area in and around our sounder station. Um, and sort of the image on your left, uh, right next to the train station, you'll see a, a larger structure. That's the cold storage building that will be eventually the parking garage for sounder station. Uh, to the north, you see a contaminated gas station and some other vacant property in and around that transit area. This is zoned uh, DCE, which means unlimited height. Lots of density encouraged by our land use code. That doesn't necessarily mean a lot of density is coming. Uh, the image on your right, you'll see that same sort of area. Uh, the regulatory uh, floodplain is in blue off of Mill Creek, and FEMA reduced risk levy is in orange. I'm going to grossly simplify, but you can build in both orange and blue, but it's much more hard to build in blue. <laughs> and that is a condition that goes up the whole span of Central Avenue right up to 167 and beyond. And so if you're looking at a boundary of a district area and you said we have a revenue source that could reduce the barriers to development in an area, remove a constraint proactively to enable that incremental growth in property valuation and pay off that debt, you're actually 
able to act on your vision. You're not just setting a regulatory framework and saying, you could build anything dense. You're actually doing something constructively to enable that to happen in an area. So uh, the strengths of putting a district here could be that there are several large and underutilized uh, parcels that if they were to develop would start adding back to the tax base and pay for that public improvement. Um, there might be some right of way in there. You can see uh, behind the school district right up against the creek, there's some roads that really no one uses and we don't really maintain anymore. There might be some abandoned right of way potential uh, in that area. Um, so there's a whole list of projects to examine when you're setting up a district based upon the strategy I just walked through a moment ago. Uh, our consultant team was working with us to, and we need to update this again. We were just talking to our parks planner an hour ago. Uh, on the new parks master plan, but uh, you know the nearby transportation improvement projects, what are the nearby parks projects? Are any of these catalytic to a development? Maybe not, but these are what we had in our plans already. And this is definitely something we should be thinking about when we're looking at comprehensive uh, planning. Um, but the, the development and revenues, so we put forward a hypothetical scenario. Let's say some of those abandoned right away or underutilized buildings or buildings are currently derelict or, or vacant today, they were knocked over for apartment buildings. What would the TIF revenue be? And then you start to say, well, that's the increment that we have to spend to actually make that vision a reality. Uh, here's another location, and our parks planner just an hour ago <laughs> pointed out to me, you know, these are actually two contiguous sites. There is the Canyon Mill Creek parcel <laughs> that is city parkland in between these two district areas. So there's maybe something to think about in terms of a uh, bigger district versus small district, something to think about or talk about. But, um, you know, we, uh, this property, for instance, was just listed in June 2022, so just a few weeks ago, for 8.1 million, which is a significant reduction in, in sales price from what it's been listed at in the past. Um, they make note of in their flyer that the zoning uh, is supported by current comp plan to change from uh, strictly retail to uh, housing or mixed use, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it would happen. <laughs> And uh, that's in part of town where I, I could imagine, a lot of people could imagine, a lot of reinvestment. Uh, how could a diff, TIF district support that? Um, some of the strengths, again, you have a seven acre site, a lot of it's a parking field. Uh, you have a bus rapid transit line coming through that area. Um, how could, you know, some of the spending that could come from a TIF district, how could that maybe create community space or improve accessibility to that bus rapid transit station on nearby roads? How could that, perhaps play a role in affordability, either commercial or housing, uh, home ownership opportunities. How could it play a role in other sites that are sort of abandoned in and around that area? Um, these are things to still address across departments, but uh, we have been looking at uh, with our consultant team over the last couple of months to sort of zero in on a couple of key opportunities and uh, understand what the TIF balance could be. Again, it would take some time, some coordination to develop projects to the point of cost estimation that we would be really confident to uh, present to you is like these are potential districts and present to the larger public uh, through a series of hearings that would have to take place to adopting a district. Um, but we've been working on it and I just wanted to present it to you now and, and get some feedback on some of these next steps. Before I do that, just one last word. Uh, I've just been doing some outreach to uh, this LISC, which stands for Local Initiatives, uh, sorry, Local Initiative Support Coalition. It's a national outfit that works on affordable housing. Uh, we've worked with Amazon now to award fellowships to 10 uh, minority uh, developers in Washington's Puget, Re Puget Sound to be part of their accelerator. They match uh, developers with uh, mentors and with funding and with sort of training to, to grow their development business. Uh, a lot of, several of them actually have ties in Kent. They either grew up in Kent, went to Kent Meridian High School, have family living in Kent still. So I've been meeting with members of that initial cohort and just sort of identifying scarce areas. So uh, with that, I just wanted to go back and rest here for questions. <laughs> or thoughts, yeah. Questions, Council Member Larmer? Yeah, so I think this, I, this seems like a very exciting tool that could help us solve some of these long-term problems we've been grappling with. Mm -hmm. um, question, you had mentioned that there's good examples and bad examples across the country. Could yeah. you give us a bad example, something sure. we should be cautious and, and I'm, cautious? Uh, 
Well, I don't think the city of Memphis will listen to me. <laughs> but I, I think they did like a river, riverboat gambling casino type development along their river waterfront. And I think uh, it was kind of example um, because Memphis and Egypt is, you know, got an association with pyramids. So Memphis and Tennessee built giant glass pyramids. And then they put a bass sporting fish store in it. And the money went directly to the developer's pocket <laughs> and said, we will pay the developer to make this attraction, which is very different than the guardrails in our state, which says, we're going to pay for a road or move a utility where the developer then trans builds it with the money that we've bonded, then transfers that asset by law back to that municipality for that asset that the taxpayer paid for. Huge difference, as you can imagine, between those two examples. Uh, a good example, I'll go to uh, Eugene, Oregon, where I used to work. I thought it was very great how they used the funding to help create a community college and student housing in their downtown, directly helping the college pay for the development of student housing for that college. Uh, I thought that made a lot of sense. Something the college wouldn't be able to afford on its own and then created some residential uh, activation of streets near its old retail district that was struggling. So that would be a good example. Okay, great, thank you, appreciate that. Councilmember Michaud. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, I don't fully understand how the money works. Okay. Sure. So you have this area, and then the 1% increase every year goes towards paying off the bond? No, what you do is you freeze the, inc you freeze the area mm -hmm. that you've drawn the district in, and that continues to pay tax like normal. And the area, uh, all the incremental valuation in that area, instead of going to those other funding sources, go to service the bond that you've issued in that So district. let's say it's like a new apartment building. All the property tax for the city of Kent from that new apartment building goes to pay off this bond. That's correct. Okay. That makes but not the land, not the under, not the existing, you know, valuation. Already there. Yeah. Okay. Just the project that wouldn't have existed save for what you've done. So basically, the school district's in a good spot in this case because they're exempted from the whole conversation. They're getting the increased bump in valuation the whole whole way. The city of Kent, for its part, you're basically deciding that this site is not going to redevelop into a large apartment building except for this action on paying for utilities. So maybe you don't see the revenue in a certain period of years, but at the end of that payment of, the, of, of doing that up front, you will then still have an apartment building that will then increase your tax base, okay. which is why so many states have used it yeah okay so yeah so still trying to understand the numbers if right. i have let's say i have a empty plot of land that's worth say the land itself is just worth half a million mm -hmm. and i put a million dollars of improvements on it mm -hmm. what part so that million tax on that million dollars of improvement is what's is going to be is the increment the bond. that's the increment okay that half a million dollars that already existed it's just the is there, you're already just getting that tax revenue. We're getting that no matter what. Okay. So okay. one of the reasons why uh, the, the ports, especially in the rural areas, have been um, at the leading the charge for the TIF in the state for many, many years, and what changed, I think, last year during COVID-19 was a lot of urban municipalities coming on board. Uh, but the reason why they were charging for it, and some of the early uses you'll see in this state, will be that you'll have big vacant par parcels of land that, but for a rail spur, <laughs> you could get a grain silo and create a lot of jobs in that neighborhood. In our urban context, it will be much more of an infill project where you will see gas stations that have been abandoned and vacant for 30, 40 years and will likely be abandoned or vacant for decades more, save some intervention. Some properties reach um, a market force dead end, and unless there is something to intervene, there won't be any incremental increase. So next steps, when will we have you back here to talk a little bit more about what areas I, where this might be utilized? It's, as you, I think I'm hoping to, to transmute here is that uh, um, there is a deadline of June of next year mm -hmm. for the, to go to the assessor's office and freeze payments in a district again. But in between now and June, we need to create amongst our departments, and I'll have a timeline for this, some coordination about setting a district around these. And it is... Uh, again, the other thing I'm trying to communicate is it is somewhat driven by a development saying, I would do this only if. And so uh, what we've done over the last four months is just sort of distill different parts of the city and said, these are areas where we think there will likely be developers 
if you only did this. And I think what I will be doing over the next several months is talking to those potential development teams and then communicating on a regular basis to you at committee how that's going. And then if we identify that the tax increment finance tool is the limiting factor that would make that go forward, come, ba come back with a process for doing that with new timelines. Um, one thing I should mention at the end here, I did kind of make an analogy to multifamily tax exemption. Interestingly, this doesn't very play very well with multifamily tax exemption, as you can imagine, because you're exempting out the same increment you would expect to pay back the bond in the multifamily. So there's a decision, which is if what is more catalytic to a specific project. And I had done that workshop a, a few weeks back now, I think the full council, where I talked about in Portland, they use some of the tax increment financing. Sometimes you use it for affordable housing, but sometimes it, its role in a development is to make the commercial space more affordable. They condition that. So it's very project specific, especially how the state wrote it, which is in this case somewhat project specific and not district wide. Drawing the nexus to, let's say, upgrading all of Mill Creek to every <laughs> parcel along that way and saying that maybe someday all the increment will come. It's kind of an untested area of this new law, an untested piece of policy. Um, so not saying we couldn't do that, but I think we need more digestion <laughs> as staff, really, frankly, to come to you with a timeline for that. So it's not something, I mean, even come next June, we might not have an opportunity where we would utilize this tool, but it's definitely something that... I would think in the next six months, I would come to you with at least one of these two projects moving forward. Okay. It's likely. Okay. Great. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank you very thank much. You. And that brings us to the last item on our agenda, which is adjourning the meeting. So thank you everyone for being here. We are adjourned. <laughs>